you're about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. On this episode of Mysteries and Monsters, I'm delighted to be joined by author, actor and illustrator Emily Carding. In their latest book, Seeking Fairy, you will delve into the histories and folklore of a variety of creatures, from the Fae to Will-o'-the-Wisps, the She and much more. It's possibly one of the most picturesque books I've ever read, thanks to the stunning work of Silo Thompson to complement Emily's writing. Emily and I discuss a wide range of topics, covering spirituality, their introduction to the worlds of tarot and wicca, overdue library books, the phenomenal Shakespearean work they've achieved, and what the future holds for them. You can find all of the work at emilycarding.com, and I thank Emily for being such a wonderful guest, despite at the time getting over COVID. Thank you, Emily. But before that, as always, Don't forget you can support Mysteries and Monsters on Patreon for $4 a month. You can click the link in the show notes, or you can go to patreon.com slash mysteriesandmonsters. You'll get ad-free episodes, guaranteed early releases, and the bonus Patreon-only content of the Paranormal Archive. Episode 3, coming soon. Mysteries and Monsters is across all social media platforms. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and please subscribe to our channel on YouTube. You can also go to mysteriesandmonsters.com for episodes, news, merchandise, and more. Thank you as always to Dean Bestall for his marvellous artwork. The show is produced by Brennan Storr of the Ghost Story Guys, and Mysteries and Monsters is delighted to be a part of the Straight Up Strange Network. Now, let us return to the realms of the Fae, Tarot, Magic, and the Supernatural in the company of the wonderful Emily Carding. On today's show, I am delighted to be joined by professional actor, illustrator, and author, Emily Carding, to discuss their wonderful new book, a fascinating insight into folklore with some simply beautiful illustrations. Seeking Fairy opens up this magical world to allow us to enter it. Emily, Welcome to Mysteries and Monsters. Hello, thank you so much for having me on. You are very welcome. You are very welcome. As we were sort of ruminating before we dove into this conversation, it's always nice to speak to somebody who's learned their professional career three miles away from where my mum lives um, at the infamous, for many of us in that locality, Britain Hall. <laughs> and looking at your resume and, and being aware of your work over the last few years, Emily, you are one of those people that uh, I just find deeply fascinating because you you just seem to be so bloody good at a lot of things. Oh, that's very kind of you to say. Thank you. Um, I just I just am interested in a lot of things, and I don't seem to be capable of having just hobbies. I have to just pursue everything, hundred <laughs> percent, and it always becomes like a passionate obsession, and then inevitably work somehow. But but thank you, and and Breton always. Just a such a beautiful, inspiring place. Well, what an amazing coincidence! It is. It is remarkable, and also the fact that you're wearing your your own and, hoodie. I know. I wish I could show people, but I mean, it's actually a fairly recent hoodie. I didn't have a hoodie from the time because that was like oh, twenty-five years ago or something. Oh my God, I've been to think about it. Time so long ago. Um, but recently, um, somebody did a big call out to old alumni. You know, who wants to have a, a a hoodie or a jump made. Mm. I did a whole run of them. You could choose your colour or whatever. And mm. so, I was, yes, but I'm I'm wearing it because it's it's lovely and snuggling, cosy, and I'm just recovering. Well, I I, th- I hope I'm recovering from COVID and not just languishing in it. I hope I'm on the way out of it now. <laughs> well, hopefully we will ease you out of it and keep as uh, the conversation as as jovial as possible, Emily, as we dive into oh, yes. your your wonderful work. Oh, I think. You've clearly had a long connection with your spiritual side and your love of this kind of subject, because I know when I've heard you speak previously with, with other shows, you were always kind of enticed by a, 
a, a tarot deck that your mother had as a child. But it's one of those temptations that I, I suspect, like me, Emily, if you're told not to read something or look at something, then you simply wait for the for the adults to leave the room. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, oh my gosh. So when I was a kid, there was a combination of things. My mum was very, she was into tarot and Ouija boards and things when she was a teenager, but also when she was a teenager, met my dad and became pregnant with me. She had me very, very young. And so she wasn't practicing anything when I was a kid, but there was a couple of, the, there was a couple of books left over that I was forbidden to look at. So obviously I didn't <laughs> get any opportunity to sneak a look at them. Mm. One was The Devil's Picture Book, which was a book about the tarot. Mm -hmm. um, very 1970s. I had a kind of like Dennis Wheatley style cover. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I was going to look at that. Yes. And the other one was The Secret Lord of Magic by Idris Shah. Mm. Which, um, is, is another one of those classics. If anybody's into grimoire and cunning magic sort of stuff. Yes. Very mysterious. I mean, it, probably as as baffling as it, to a seven year old as it might be to any random person of any in, in adult age picking it up now. When you turn to a page and it says, "How to make a man appeareth as if he hath three heads," <laughs> <laughs> very useful practical skills like that. Yes, but I was intrigued mm. by that. Also, to thinking about this, I was much more naughty and rebellious than than I would give myself credit for because I was very well behaved, except that I don't know how I discovered this, but I used to sneak into my mum's room. I must have been, it was, you know, the 70s and 80s, I was left alone a lot. Yes. <laughs> there was, um, it was like a little wicker jewellery box. And mm. in that was this old pewter, like quite a big, like, pewter medallion with a triskel on it, the triple spiral. Yes. I was fascinated by this symbol. And that, with those two books, made me think, my mum must be a witch. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, yeah, didn't really understand any of it at the time, but I knew that this symbol meant something. That symbol became very important to me. Still, it's a key symbol for me. Mm. But also, as as a as a child and certainly then going into my teens before I really had had chance to read that much or or know that much, coming from a fairly apathetic but Catholic family, I started to have these dreams where I would go through a door in in a, a hill. There was a light behind this door. It was in the garden in my dream, but there was a hill in the garden that wasn't there in real life. And there was a door in this hill in the garden. Mm -hmm. I'd pass through and go underground and meet with these fairy beings and all kinds of mythic creatures there and go on missions for them, which felt very real, sometimes quite perilous. Not everything in there was friendly by any means, mm. but quite epic. And it was on only much later in life when I started to read more about um about the, the myths and the, the folklore and, and the nature of these beings that it, it kind of made sense. And I was like, wow, mm. that's kind of confirmation for me. Because as a kid, that's not what you're told fairies are. You're sort of, most people anyway are brought up with this idea of these very um, benign, small, diminutive winged beings that maybe flit about your flowers and grant wishes or something. If you're lucky enough to have seen the movie Labyrinth, you know that things are not always what they seem. <laughs> yes, very true. But beyond that, you know, you didn't really get to to see much of the, um, more of the truth behind it all. Mm. So yeah, that was a very interesting um, journey for me when I first started to learn things to look back at the stuff and go, well, that, that shows to me that's confirmation that I was experiencing something on some level that was that was real yeah so what do you say because obviously you've become a an extremely powerful and captivating performer on stage and i think primarily with some of the the shakespearean work that you've done which is really sort of pushing the boundaries in regards to what people find acceptable or consider how shakespeare should be done obviously you've had a, an award-winning performance as Richard III, and obviously you've done Hamlet as well, as well as sort of bringing things up with the with the rather fantastic Quintessence, which was uh, a show that you were touring a couple of years ago before we all got told to stay in. And yet, I'm very surprised when, when I've heard you talk about 
your development into acting and how you came to it. But once again, it seems that you were you were quite a late developer in discovering this love of, of the spiritual as well as finding that your passion for, for acting was something that kind of developed quite late on. Whereas I think some people would kind of expect when they look at your resume and, and see you perform, they would imagine that you were the, uh, the, the type of person that would perhaps always want to perform. And yet when I've read interviews with you previously and, and seen you speak about this, this seemed to be, seemed to happen to you by chance. Yes and no. It, 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 it partly coming from a working class background. Mm-hmm. Um, I come from uh, Stoke on Trent, well, near Stoke on Trent, Newcastle under Lyme originally. Yes, my auntie used to have a pub in Newcastle under Lyme. No way! Yeah, the red line just off the roundabout as you came in towards on the way up to Hanley. <laughs> oh my God, that's amazing. More, more synchronous references. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I, I went to uh, St John Fisher High yes. School. Yeah. Okay. We didn't have drama mm-hmm. at my school. So I really did. The, the, it, was, it wasn't in my family at all. There was no, nothing creative, nothing artistic or anything in my family. Very standard working class family. At least on one side, on my dad's side. My mum had, my mum's side was weird in terms of her sister became incredibly posh and rich, but, but, but our family was very working class and I was the first person to go away to university or any of that stuff. But, um, so there was no, it was just something that was in me, just inherently in me. I was always drawing and all of that. We had half mm. school, but there was no drama. And I remember I was always pestering my English teachers for drama class, like an after school thing or anything. There was no club, there was nothing. Mm. There was something, it was something I wanted to do, but I didn't have the opportunity to do it. Mm. Um, so it wasn't until I went to A-level college, which was Newcastle Land College, which was next door. Mm-hmm. I didn't got to do any drama at all. Yeah. Um, and I'd only done, I'd done GCSE drama, then I did a year of that at Newcastle College and, um, ah, sorry, sitting weird. Um, and I'd done one year of A-level theatre. Um, as well as a whole bunch of other subjects. I kind of wanted to be a film director, you know. Mm. But I also I wanted to act. I ended up staying at college for years because I kept leaving it too late to apply for the course that I wanted to do. <laughs> so hello, I'm diagnosed ADHD, and um, so I just <laughs> was studying everything. I studied so many things that I didn't even take exams in because I hadn't registered for them properly. I was just turning up to the class. <laughs> <laughs> classical studies and all kinds of things where the lecturers were like, did you even register properly? I was like, no, but um, <laughs> um, I was going to be there for a fourth year. I think the, my fourth year had just started and I just started doing radio and journalism or some bollocks as well. <laughs> and I was going to be doing the second year of my theatre A level. Yeah. And my art lecturer and my theatre lecturer and myself just had this completely synchronistic meeting in a corridor where my art teacher went, Emily Carding, are you still here? <laughs> You're looking for that classics theater- class. <laughs> my first lecturer went, oh, actually you don't have to be because some spaces have just come up at Bretton Hall through clearing. Come and have a chat with me in my office. Her husband at the time worked at Bretton and I don't know what capacity I'm in or something. Mm. That was like... The same week, I think I got, they got me an interview and an audition on the Friday at Brenton mm. of that week or something, because it was so close to term starting. So, and then, and then I started on the Monday. <laughs> <laughs> What's insane. What happened was the college needed more money. So they made up a course, like an extra course to bring in more students at the last minute so mm. the college could get more money. Yeah. And it was, um, it was a, broadcast theatre arts course that they'd kind of cobbled together at the last minute. So it's marvellous to be there. We did bits of live, we did a lot of live theatre and we did a lot of radio. We didn't do that much video or TV stuff because they just didn't have the equipment. They'd made this course up. (laughs) But anyway, I spent the whole of my first year in this kind of dazed, uh, (laughs) not expecting to be anywhere at all. Then suddenly I was at drama school with no experience. Everybody around me had been doing it since they were three yeah. or whatever. 
like the bone into tap shoes or whatever. And there was me. <laughs> and, you know, weirdo that I was. Also exploring my spirituality for the first time, being away from home for the first time. Mm -hmm. Not really understanding how to human properly at that point. Yeah. Not understanding why I didn't fit in with the other theatre kids when I was hanging around in a green cloak, sitting in trees and stuff. <laughs> It was a lovely time, but yeah, no, I did. Want, I did want to be an actor, and then um, I did. I did train, tra trained at Breton, like in the nineties, mm. and then didn't really know what the hell I was doing. I think because I didn't really have that much experience at that point, mm. I did go on to do bits and bobs. Back then, I did Cambridge Shakespeare Festival. I worked at the London Dungeon for a bit. Yeah. I didn't really do, I, I was working bits and bobs of things for a few years on and off with doing like normal jobs, um, as, as lots of people have to, you know, I was doing day jobs and things to support it and things. And and at that point I'd married somebody, just some dude, I was married, I just found him lying around. And, uh, my, and I, I married somebody straight out of the uh, university that I'd met there, which is a terrible idea, mm -hmm. who was a musician. So we sort of alternated who would do the day job and support the other one and do creative bits more, but never really anything yeah. too substantial. Didn't know what the hell I was doing really. Mm. Then accidentally became pregnant. Um and because I wasn't at the any kind of financial position to afford childcare or anything like that and wasn't really established enough to be able to sustain a career with a child at that point, just left. Mm. And I also left that husband, um, met somebody else who was um, very much into the magical side of things. Yeah. And that's when I was writing and creating tarots and very much existing as a writer and an artist for many, many years. I think about um, 10 or 11 years, mm. just doing that, not acting at all. Yeah. Never thinking I would go back to it, missing it terribly. Because mm. whenever I would see a play or something, it was quite painful yes but at the same time just thinking that that was it that that, that was just not something i did anymore and then um around, it was around 2011 and i started getting the very i was living in cornwall at the time which is the world's least practical place to live <laughs> in the middle of nowhere in cornwall yes and i i was very i was getting a very strong urge to go back to theater I'd always had this deep love of Shakespeare mm. from, from school, really. So even though we didn't have drama, we had English, obviously. And yeah. I didn't understand why nobody else understood these works. I I just had an instinctive love of. Mm. I sort of started to chew this idea around in my head. I was like, I'd love to, maybe if there was a part-time course or something, you know, because I still have um, my daughter to look after. And, you know, they're older now. They could deal with me not being around a bit at a time and then at school and things like that. Yeah. Um, and then I so put that, put, chew it up and put it down. And and then there was this one day where um, I was in bed on my phone and the only way you could get a signal, like the Wi-Fi, because it was in the countryside, whatever, holding the phone like above my head in yeah. bed, <laughs> dropped the phone and it landed on my mouth, like on my teeth. <laughs> it quite hurt. <laughs> Ow. Got my attention, picked up my phone, and my phone was open on the complete works of Shakespeare, which mm. I had not been looking at. Mm. And I was like, well, that's a sign. Okay, let's have a look and see what there is around that I can get to. Yeah. And quickly discovered that there was a postgrad course at uh, the University of Exeter. Yeah, yeah, just over the border. Yeah, which was about 50 minute drive, and I could drive at that point. Like, okay. Um, and it was specifically in staging Shakespeare. Mm. So I applied for that. I got a place on that. At the time, I was lucky enough to then be married to somebody who had money. So I was privileged enough to be able to afford to pay for a postgrad course at that time. Yeah. And that was extraordinary. Extraordinary. Completely turned my life. Just completely transformed my life. Mm. But that's, that's really where everything started to come together. And what started off as a one-year MA became a two-year MFA, which is basically the same stuff, but twice. Yeah. <laughs> but it was great because some of that stuff included like a two-week residency at the Globe. Awesome. Fabulous. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. Talk about Shakespeare and magic. Blimey, that's a magical place. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was an extraordinary time. And I met wonderful people like Kolbram Bjord Sigpastot here, who's an Icelandic director that I collaborated with to create the Richard III show and, and the Hamlet show and Shakespeare in Hell and yeah. other things. In my head was like a part-time thing became full-time absolute obsession. And when I wasn't doing the course, which was enough work as it was, yeah. was also creating and co-creating work with all of these people there in these spaces. So valuable as as training. It wasn't actor training. It, it, thankfully, I'd already done that. But I also found that the years that I'd spent training in, in magical work and my spiritual work had informed me as an actor to become a much more better and empathetic, um, present, powerful actor. Mm. That journey was extraordinary. But what was wonderful about this course was how it taught you to be self-sufficient and, and creative and resourceful and think to think creatively and to take the works of Shakespeare as raw material to do things with. Yeah, so absolutely where all of this work um, was rooted from. And my, my thesis, I decided very early on, was going to be on the, um, the practical application of the hermetic content of Shakespeare. So a lot of that work, hmm. as, as a thesis, it ended up being a little flawed because I was going through a divorce at the time that I was writing it in 2014 at the end of that course. Mm -hmm. Husband was very supportive in, in the sense of like, yes, I'll pay for you to go and do this course, but I don't want you like not being in the house or being confident or any of these things. Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> so that ended. Yeah. And, so yeah, but, but, but then I took the work that I'd done for my thesis and I expanded on it and I did um, a lot more for the pagan and for the magical spiritual audience in mm. what was to become so potent art, the magic of Shakespeare. Yes. My uh, book that came out from the wedding last summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I find it remarkable, Emily, when I look at that and you, you talk about that period of your life because sort of before all you you kind of managed to 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 accidentally find as you say this sign that appears on your phone and often when we're we're caught in situations in life where we feel lost or we we drifting or we we wonder what if it's it's very strange how sometimes we can stumble on things and it just completely changes our directions and a, a, and a very similar thing happened to me when when I was recuperating from a from a very serious bout of of mental illness about four four years ago before I made the plunge to start the show and and I was basically laid in bed recuperating and reading some of my old collections of ghost stories and I stumbled on a on an account about a poltergeist in Runcorn and um, and I adore poltergeists they've always been my favorite part of the paranormal and I just couldn't believe that I'd completely forgotten about this case. And it just seemed to, to light a fire in my soul for some reason and just really began to infuse me. And from, from essentially zero to a hundred in about two hours, I'd gone from wondering how I'd ended up at this point in my life being in my sort of early forties and, and feeling completely listless to suddenly thinking, do you know what? It's about time I just sort of grabbed what I loved with both hands and did do what I want with it, which is how I've ended up to this point. So yeah. I think often when we're at our lowest or we're fe feeling more challenged than we've ever had in our lives, it can be random things that suddenly set our, our life on the course that perhaps we've, we've missed out on for 10, 15 years. And, and obviously there was something bubbling along with you because I know prior to this, you were, you were creating these beautiful tarot sets that you've done, which I find remarkable. I mean, the, the transparent tarot, when I've seen you do readings and, and online seminars in regards to demonstrating this beautiful deck, I find incredible primarily on the fact that it's a beautiful thing to look at, regardless of its potency as a guide and a, and a connection with the spirit world, but also the fact that it seemed to just come to you sort of I think you you were saying you were at Loch Lomond when the idea sort of popped into your head at three in the morning and you were kind of stuck there thinking, well, I can't do anything because I'm in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, you really have done your research, haven't you? Love that. <laughs> well, I was actually with the Loch Lomond, yes, New Year's. Um, and um, I had no way of of checking to see whether anybody else had had this idea that just burst fully formed into my head and moved a bit bolt upright at 3am. <laughs> it was crazy. 
I started sketching things down like like a person possessed. Mm. And yeah, as soon as I found out that nobody else had done it, I was so keen to be the first. I would also love for other people to take the idea and run with it and develop it yeah. in their own way. Um, but the whole way that it came out was was like um, a feverish intellectual chan- channeling. I, I couldn't tell you now how, but it, it was so cl- ironically uh, clear. Um, yes. as it, was, it was coming through that there would be these images, um, there would be minimalist, that you could read them in layers, they'd form a new picture each time. Um, I did them on tracing paper initially to test them out, and then I was scanning them onto the computer and playing with, and only really to, to a certain extent, could you plan what the combinations would be, and then it was trusting mm. that it would work when it was out there. But you know, nobody wanted to publish it initially. Um, none of the known, like established publishers would touch it because it was so different. Yeah. They were a little afraid because it would cost more to produce because mm-hmm. it would have to be produced on transparent plastic. And Schiffer at the time had only produced one other tower. Yes. Which was um, Kim Huggins' uh, first deck, the um, Sol Invictus tower, I think. Mm-hmm. And so they didn't really know. They just saw an idea that they thought was good and they were like, Guess we'll just charge more. And I'm so grateful to them for yeah. sticking their neck out. You know, Diana Rosebury, the acquiring editor, and um, Peter Schiffer Sr., who sadly passed away a few years ago, but it mm. was Schiffer Sr. At the, at the time who took that idea on. So grateful to them because I couldn't have produced it myself. And I'm very happy to have ideas and put them out there. But in terms of books and whatnot, anyway, I, I don't want them. I don't want to do the production side of that. <laughs> so yeah, so I'm very, very grateful to them. Yeah. I think it's it's interesting because obviously you, you were clearly still in touch with your spiritual side, regardless of, as you were saying, the professional challenges that you had gone through mm. and, uh, and also the challenges in your personal life, Emily, that you were still connected to that side of your personality that you were clearly in touch with your spirituality and, and exploring that because obviously... You've you've continued to develop those ideas, so obviously that was something that was still very key in your mind. Wherever you'd filed it, as often when we have a passion that real life gets in the way, we tend to kind of put things away. And as as I refer to the amount of things I've remembered that I knew about that I've kind of reopened in my head over the last three years is quite frightening because I kind of in my my sort of twenties when I moved to Sheffield and and ended up in the entertainment industry, I kind of put all my love of the paranormal and the weird to one side and occasionally just dip back into it. Mm. And yet it was always there and I still all retain the information, but it wasn't the kind of subjects I would be talking to with my friends down at the local pub. So um, it, it is strange how these passions that ignite us in, in our childhood and our teens kind of just sit there waiting for us to come back to them, I think. I don't think it's ever been something that I've, I've, I've put, I've, it's always been central to mm. me. I think the only time I might have tried to put it to one side when I was about 15 and wanted desperately to be into Bross and Aha like everybody else. <laughs> and I tried to make that really work, but it didn't really work. And, um, <laughs> yeah, because I was like seeing ghosts as a kid and my nickname was Ghost mm. as a, in primary school. And, I was always picked on for being weird. So for for yeah. me, it's always been always been central. And um I think I was lucky enough during that time when I left theatre, hmm. but I had I had my daughter to bring up. But um as I said, I was with this uh, the second husband, as it were, who did have a great career. And I was fully supported in being an artist at that point. Yeah. And in turn, my art was always centered around my magic. And I was also, my, my spirituality and magic was central at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was theater that took the back seat. Yes. And then that was the thing that was bubbling away. Mm. And so with, with, and I very much recognized when I went back into theater that my magical training and my, my ceremonial training, but particularly, but my spiritual practices in terms of connection and channeling, which were, I think, my, my key function 
like, like in my, my key spiritual role. It's not just as an artist, as somebody who produces things. It's actually that it, it, it's as a kind of a creative channel. So all this stuff just feels like it comes from somewhere. Mm -hmm. So like a bridge, basically, like with the Tower, with the tower of the Shia, I always considered to be like a bridge between this world and the other world. Yes. And so I just saw theatre. In terms of my own work, obviously I do, you know, other jobs that are acting jobs mm -hmm. um, in film and whatever, where I will do whatever is required of me in, in that job. And yes. sometimes these skills will be, I mean, obviously it's the way that I work. Yeah. So sometimes they're more in the forefront than, than others. But it, 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 theatre to me in my own work is just another form of expression for the core of magic and spirituality and acting is this bridge of connection between worlds. Yeah, yeah. With theatre, there's the opportunity to take an audience on on an initiatory and transformative journey. Yes. It doesn't need to be overtly like, the audience doesn't need to be told there's something magical in there. <laughs> <laughs> me, boys, girls, let me take you on a magical journey to the centre of yourself. Yeah. No, it's about the exploration of humanity. <laughs> yeah. Which is part of, you know, that's what I'm drawn to about Shakespeare is... Uh, mm extraordinary way that he captures and connects to the human spirit over the centuries. Yeah. Still relevant. Yeah, very much so. And obviously, one of the things I think often gets overlooked is is the amount of connection to spirituality and magic that permeates his work. Obviously, for most people, they will think immediately, probably the, the, the easiest example is obviously the witches. But there are other notable pointers throughout his work, which kind of gives you that kind of impression obviously the, the period of of creation for for the works of shakespeare there was a lot of strange things going on in the in the country anyway and a lot of you know you had to be very careful what you said and how you said it about certain things and and whatever so it's it's very odd to me sometimes that when we look at that kind of work that people just seem to miss these little sort of nuance nods to the mythology and, and magic of the era uh, and, and seem to focus more on the epic scale of it. But, you know, obviously we've got ghosts, we've got witches. I mean, it was very interesting uh, the other day I, I, I caught the beginning of, of Orson Welles's Is it Hamlet or Macbeth? With the witches? Yes. Macbeth. Thank you. I always get those two mixed up for some reason. I think it's the ghost holder. A lot of people do. <laughs> a lot of people do. I think it's something just to do with the rhythm of the world as well. It's from those brain things. Uh, absolutely, yes. And um, But he was probably the first person that, rather than have them as central tenets of, of witchcraft, he was kind of using them as druids, which mm. I think is only something that's really sort of come back to the fore over the last sort of 10, 20 years where people are sort of looking back at certain aspects of, of how witchcraft and, and witches have sort of been portrayed in entertainment, Emily, that Nothing. Wells was clearly well ahead of his time because he was trying to sort of de Well ahead of his time. Well, yes. For, for un unsurprisingly, a man, a man born out of time for me, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It's very interesting with Shakespeare. You can take, you can take those plays and set them in any context, in any place, in any time, in mm. any culture. Yes. So you want to make them work. And so they do become, they become a, a vehicle for whatever message mm -hmm. you like, in a sense, uh, kind of reinterpret them for any age. But there's there's underlying truths there, I think, for people who, who wish to dig mm. a bit deeper. And perhaps people are starting to rediscover a, a, a sort of a love of magic and mystery a bit more these days. There would have been a trend for taking the myth out and making it, you know, contemporary and relevant. Yes. Misunderstanding that myth is always, always relevant. Mm. But you, you have a problem with, um, with plays like Macbeth or like with, with Hamlet, in fact, that if you take the supernatural out completely and give it some rational explanation, you lose something of the power of the story mm. and you lose, you kind of have to suspend that disbelief. Even if you don't believe in supernatural, the paranormal things yourself, you have to believe that the characters do because otherwise it loses something. Yes. So you take Hamlet, who is visited by the ghost of his father, who tells him to 
to revenge mm. himself. You know, the, the ghost tells him that it was, you know, Hamlet's uncle, the, the ghost's brother, that killed him and that he must take revenge. Yeah. And what Shakespeare does is he has the ghost be seen by other people before Hamlet mm. sees the ghost. So, and, and the other people that, because Hamlet is not necessarily, you know, your most trustworthy, men, has the most trustworthy mental state, which is established. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so if you only saw Hamlet see the ghost, you could be like, as many people still do, because they haven't really thought about it, probably they go, ah, oh, well, you see, it's just Hamlet's madness, isn't it? The ghost does that. But at the beginning of the play, you have um, Horatio. Yes. So, um, Horatio, Hamlet's best friend, university educator, the most solid grounded, earthy, reliable character, trustworthy narrator, if you like, mm -hmm. that they has. Yes. And he sees it right at the beginning. He doesn't believe in any of this stuff and he sees it. So you know then as an audience that you are meant to believe that this ghost is real and trust what it has to say. Mm. Or at least believe that it's real. There is a certain question there as to whether it's the devil in disguise or whatever. There's a whole there's, there's a whole interest in the ghost as as a sort of a political thing um, in terms of what the ghost represents. Yeah. The shift in beliefs at the time between Catholicism and Church of England and the shift from the Renaissance cult philosophy into the humanist philosophies um, because the ghost has come from purgatory and mm -hmm. Catholicism at the time was forbidden, if you like, frowned upon. Yes. So you have the ghost come up with these two university educated kids or, or guys, you know, depending, they're, they're in the thirties or whatever, but anyway, but, but, but basically Hamlet's mentally a kid anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> students, they're students, yes. but, they're, but they, they're university educated in, um, the, the home of, of humanist philosophies. So they have been, they've been told that this stuff isn't real. And then you have this ghost actually come up and say, yes, I'm in purgatory causing you, you to question the whole philosophy of the time and the shift in philosophy of the time, but also potentially Shakespeare. It, it, it's dangerous, I think, to, uh, to try and seek the author's beliefs within these works, particularly in early modern writers. But if you look consistently through the works, the attitude to magic and supernatural and paranormal and things, you do see a running theme of an older generation that believed in these things being right. Yes. And the younger generation who's mocking them being proven wrong. Mm. And you see that consistently through through the works. So I draw my own conclusions from that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 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 you know, during you, this beautiful tarot deck um, and, and drawing inspiration from, from your connection to your spirituality and, and the world around you, Emily. Is this when you sort of, because I know you've also mentioned that you've got a, a deep interest in Arthurian mythology and lore as well. So is that something that kind of came along? Because I think often we kind of look to, to other countries in regards to folklore and myth and legend. And, and, and I'm as guilty of this as anybody that we seem to have or, or seem to look back at ourselves and, and think it's not particularly interesting. And what I think now, compared to what I thought 20, 30 years ago about Arthur and, and some of the great Cornish and Welsh myths of that era, is, is completely different. I've gone completely 360. So was that something you had always had an interest in, or has that developed alongside your, your, your understanding and your thirst for knowledge in regards to your, your spiritual connection? You know, well, 80s film and telly's got a lot to answer for, and I... <laughs> yeah. I'm very grateful to them for that because as a kid, I grew up with Robin of Sherwood. Yes. And Excalibur. Yes. Captured my imagination. Just a deep resonance with the visuals, the magic, the myth of those shows and that film. And, I mean, it's a, it was a rich time for, for fantasy films with the real sense of myth and folklore about them. The people who made those films knew what they were doing. Yeah. Still, Paul Excalibur has not been remotely, nothing's come close to it in terms of putting Arthurian myth on screen. No, very true. Um, I remember doing GCSE art and um, you got to choose like three themes for projects. And one was dragons and one was King Arthur. It was always, I just loved it. Yeah. I just, yeah, deep love of those myths and read a lot about it as a kid. Um, my, one of my favourite book series uh, growing up was Mary Stewart's Merlin trilogy. Mm -hmm. 
Crystal Cave, The Hollow Hills, The Last Enchantment, those books. Loved those. Felt a deep resonance with Merlin mm. as a figure in his many forms. Yeah. And Nimue as his polarity, if you like. So yeah, that was always there too. So when I first started to, when I first left home and I went away and I went to drama school, there was this magic shop pentagram that I used to hang out in, in Wakefield. Yes, know it well. Real? Yeah, it's the, the, it used to be downstairs, you had to go downstairs, all black walls and things. Is that the place? Yeah. Yeah, it used to get, it used to sell joysticks and things like that as well as uh, yeah. all kinds of tie-dye uh, covers and things. <laughs> yeah, there was Morgana, the clothes shop that was upstairs and then the pentagram was downstairs. Yeah. Um, we used to have books and crystals and used to be run by, many, many years ago when I was there, it was run by a couple called David and Diane. Who, uh, we won't go into that here from the public. <laughs> <laughs> but that was an adventure, let's say. Um, but, they, but, you know, at the time they were mentors to me and I thank them for that. Mm. Um, and that was where I bought my first, my first tarot that I really resonated with myself, which was John and Kathleen Matthews' Arthurian tarot. So I didn't. My my mum did actually give me her Rider Waite tarot, mm. um, but I never, I didn't really get on with it. But I think that specific deck itself had some weird energy in it that I could never really shift. Uh, yes, yeah. Always make negative readings. Mm. But um, but yeah, so I, I sort of taught myself to read tarot initially with the Arthurian tarot because those landscapes, I don't know if you know the deck, it's beautiful. The artwork's gorgeous. Mm. It's mostly landscapes. Yeah. And there's just a real... A real gateway sense to them, and I just felt those stories, and because I knew them so well, hmm. I could reach instinctively and intuitively with those cards. So yeah, so that, so that's that's a, a mythology that's always been a very deep part of of my self, I guess. Yeah, it is interesting when I speak to to people that use tarot, and as I say, my my knowledge has come on in leaps and bounds through speaking hmm. to people such as yourself, Emily. I find it very interesting that. People will often say that there is a, a, it's all about how a deck feels, as you refer to there, that it, it seems to channel things or give bad readings. It's, do you think that's because sometimes it's because of the people that have owned them or the placing of the cards and the environment they're in that they're able to sort of absorb this negativity and simply just pass it back out? Or do you just sometimes think that, you know, that bad decks are bad decks? Because I know for some people that aren't open to this kind of conversation or these kind of uh, concepts will probably say, well, that's just personal choice. But I've heard it from more than enough people and, and know enough about, you know, my, my, my grandmother would consider herself a white witch. The, uh, the interesting conversation I remember at six years old after finding her crystal ball was, was something that's always stayed with me. Um, and so, um, for me, I've always been very open-minded in regards to this because I understand the connection an inanimate object can have emotionally. Mm. Many different explanations, I would say. I would take that on an individual case-by-case -case basis. This particular deck of cards that I've been given was just, I think, something particularly dodgy had been done with it in some teenage nonsense. Yes. And as any objects can it just had something gnarly in it that I just could for some reason couldn't shift and it was a weird one because normally you know pack of cards pack of cards a, a tarot deck is a pack of cards with pictures on it yeah but any object can carry energy yes and this particular pack of cards was just not it just didn't it wasn't just that I didn't like the pictures didn't quite work for me or anything it was just it was gnarly and it, it, I ended up burning it actually mm. interesting story in a cauldron <laughs> but after that created my first tarot deck, uh -huh. like some kind of release of, yeah. of energy and very pretty colours. Um, don't go burning your tarot decks, people. But if you do, because of the coloured inks, uh, they burn very pretty. Anyway. Um, do that outside. But <laughs> yeah, do, do that outside. <laughs> uh, but generally, I don't think there's some... Th th I mean, there are decks that people have just... There are decks that people have done, you know, they've done the work, they've studied what symbolism is, they've brought their own interpretation to it and they've, and they've created something wonderful and that's great. Mm. There are 
decks, which are blatantly consumerist marketing ploys. And fair enough. And and ultimately, if you want to collect tarot for the art, I've got way more decks than I'm ever going to use. That, that's that's cool. Tarot as an art form in itself is cool. Yeah. On a practical level, a tarot deck is a collection of symbols, and symbols are a language. And each of us in ourselves is a walking dictionary of symbolism. We will go through our lives and accumulate different meanings for symbols for ourselves. Mm. And so it makes sense with the many thousands of, of decks that there are available now that you'll find some decks which kind of match, which line up, that resonate with your particular dictionary within you of symbolism, yes. that speak your language, mm. and others that don't speak your language. It's a different language or one that just so at the sound that it doesn't quite work for you. Mm. And that's that's fair enough. There are plenty, plenty of options out there. So that's another reason why somebody might look at, at a deck and go, ooh, I don't like the energy of that. That might just be an instinctive reaction to, actually, I just don't quite resonate with that, something jarring about it. Yeah. But I'm sure some people find that with Tarot of the She. They don't like the way that it has a very otherworldly energy. It's very alien mm -hmm. to some people. It, 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 it is a fairy deck, but it's not what some people think of as fairy, and it has a very kind of cosmic energy too. And some people will react badly to that because it's just, you know, that's not what they want. And that's fair enough. Not everything is for everyone. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, I think a collection of, as, as with many things of this nature, something might have, you might have the same reaction to something mm. for a collection of different reasons. Mm. Yeah. So, gravitating from, from creating the tarot deck, mm. Emily, how did you come to the, to the conclusion or, or make that decision that you were going to write your first book? Because obviously, Seeking Fairy is your most recent publication, but... Mm. You've obviously been writing for, for the best part of a decade um, and you've covered the mysticism of Shakespeare, as we said in, in one of your previous works. You've also done uh, another book in regards to the Fae and you've also contributed essays and uh, chapters in, in other collections in regards to this over this this period. So was that, would you say that was a natural progression from you to do that or, or was that something that you'd always wanted to do as well? Because as I was saying, you you seem to be able to sort of turn your hand to things and and just create lovely things. Oh, thank you. It was a natural progression in a sense that I'd written the accompanying books to my tarot's. Yeah. So so yeah, so transparent tarot because it was such a different concept. I wrote a massive book to go with it. So it felt like I had a lot to say. Yes. And then I, I found that. Well, I enjoy having written things. I don't know whether I enjoy writing things, but I, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. But it's, it's like, I, th I think that I, I'm quite good at putting complicated ideas into a relatable form in, yes. in writing. I think that's, as a, as a writer, I think that might be my strength to try and make concepts accessible. Yes. I don't like the idea of academic writing that obscures everything just to make you sound clever. Yes. Again, it's that wanting to build connection and words are another avenue through which I can help people to connect with ideas mm -hmm. and worlds. So from having, I mean, the Transparent Tarot book is like a full length, chunky book. So really that's the first proper book that I wrote. But but both of the fairy books that I've written, they kind of, they asked me to. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, sure, I can do that. I'm not sure that, that it's necessary. I was quite busy, sort of quite happy trundling along on my own path with, with fairy stuff. The Tower of the She was like my big spiritual mission. I was like, yeah, this is how I will communicate my understanding of what this realm is and enable people to connect to it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, people ask you to do things. So you're like, sure. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be happy to. So that's kind of how both of the fairy books came, came about from, from Llewellyn. It, fairy craft happened because Barbara Moore, who's done a lot of stuff for Llewellyn, was staying with me in Cornwall for a while. Yeah. I forget why, but she was, she was there. She was lovely. Um, and, uh, and so having spent some time with me, she recommended me to Llewellyn to, to write fairy craft. They wanted somebody to write a fairy lifestyle book, really, mm. both a magical practice book. I, I put as much stuff in there as I felt was, was reasonable, but they wanted something on people who practice things. They wanted, you know, the 
something with lots of pictures of the fairy festivals. And um, yes. so I did interviews with people that I knew, you know, artists and musicians and creatives. Yeah. And that was wonderful. And trying to present people with as many options of paths as possible, because I believe that there was as many paths really as there are people to mm. tread. There's no right one true way or any of this nonsense. So I wanted to get sort of inform people of what was out there and give them like a beginning place. Yes. In a in a format that was friendly and, and fun. It was kind of a fun book. Um I, I like to call it my sugar coated knowledge pill. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people who didn't bother to read it properly looked at it and went, Oh, is this full of pictures? <laughs> mm, it's just fluffy nonsense. It's like, well, if you actually, if you actually read it, you'll see that it's some helpful stuff in that. So, okay. But if it's beginner's level, yes. beginner's level, start your, find, find your own path, off you go, have fun. And then, and then, yeah. So much, much more recently, I think because of, of Barry Croft, um, I was approached to, to do Seeking Fairy and I was like, oh, lovely. So I brought a bit more folklore to that. Uh, there's a more distilled version of, um, bringing in exercises to help people build connection with the world around you, mm -hmm. you know, to help expand your senses so that you can become more aware of anything otherworldly that might be happening around you. Yeah. Um, and to enable people to make their own connections so that they can continue up on, on their journey and build it for themselves and to give people the tools and a bit of knowledge and like explain with each chapter, there's a bit of folklore from different landscapes, you know, from the the key sort of fairy landscapes, Wales and Ireland and Scotland and Cornwall, Britain, uh, from where a lot of these stories come, and then explaining a little bit about what the key symbols in there are, the myths and so on, to try just try and, and guide people. But yeah, it was it it was um, because they asked me to, so I was very honoured to be asked to do that, and what a, a beautiful thing it turned out to be. I'm so delighted with it. The Ciola Thompson's work, the illustrator, is just gorgeous and I think very complimentary to to the words. Absolutely. And I think as you were saying there about your first book in regards to fairies, I think often, especially in as we've sort of grappled with the internet and, and social media and things like that, it's it's something I've found quite interesting because obviously I've I've spoken to a lot of practicing witches. Uh, and and other writers of of folklore, and for me, I think it's one of the most positive aspects of the growth in social media and online entertainment and streaming. Emily, that people are able to kind of find their own path outside of their immediate sort of location, as it were. Because obviously, for 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 people like us that were growing up, it, it would be very rare that you would stumble across books on folklore and, and fairies in, in our school libraries or even in our local libraries back in those days, if we were lucky to find kind of like that. Kind of book from my library on Gartha from school. <laughs> I never took back. <laughs> I'm, glad, that. I'm glad it's not just me. <laughs> I've got a ghost book that I think is about 32 years overdue. So, uh, oh, yeah, no. I think we're both... Do you have Osborne's, the Osborne's oh. ghost? Yes. Well, wow, I was obsessed with that book. Yeah, I was so excited when that got re-released re the other year. I was, I, I I was literally it. like I was eight again. I was excited. And again, as you're saying, through social media, how you discover things, to find all of these other people who must have been the weirdos of their schools as well. I was really impressed with it. As kids, I was like, I thought I was the only one who had <laughs> obsessed with that book. Yeah, yeah. It was one of those that I don't know. Ironically, I don't know what ever happened to that. It just vanished. Um, but it, it was there, and as soon as I saw the cover, I was I was transported back thirty odd years, Emily. It was like all those photos, those spooky, spooky photos that haunted our imagination. Yes, the thing. Oh, the my first introduction to Jeff the Talking Mongoose. <laughs> oh my God! Yes. <laughs> so it it for me, I think it's it's really positive that for a lot of people, I think as you were saying about how you pitched that first book. For some people who are trying to get into this, if you go down the wrong way, you can suddenly find yourself sort of mid-level folklore or fairy knowledge level. And you, you've no idea what people are talking about, the ideas, the concepts, the connections. And I think... Oh, there's some bollocks out there, though, too. I mean, that's, that's yes. the dark side of... Well, yeah, as, as with anything. The connection and the availability of information is amazing. But the other thing is any old 
tosspot can put whatever they want out there and you, you don't necessarily learn discernment. Precisely. It's really important to give people foundational options out there so they can learn discernment. Not only, you know, I'm not saying that there's like, there's one way that's right. Mm-hmm. I'd say the opposite of, of that. But to if you can learn why some things are the way that they are and why they're not the way that some other people might say they are and learn discernment for yourself, then you're able to form your own path and form your own opinions on things. Yeah. Because, yeah, it's it's a weedy, weedy path out there. It's it's thorny mm. and people have left a lot of their trash uh, in the bushes as well. <laughs> it is. And I think often when you're talking, especially when you're talking about fairy lore and, and the history of it, as you were touching on there about the focus of the new book in regards to looking at these different aspects. It it surprises me because, like I say, I'm no expert on this, but I knew enough to know that the Fae in Scotland are not the Fae in Ireland and are certainly not the Fae in Wales or Cornwall or Brittany or anything. But because they all kind of get pushed under this umbrella by certain channels into being all Celtic, <laughs> then... Well, that's fine, but Scots Celts are not the same as the Welsh Celts, are not the same as Irish Celts, are certainly not the same as the Cornish Celts. It, and it baffles me that there seems to be this concept for some that they have to kind of put everything into a blender, it's and really- it and it makes the same, and it's and it's not fair because especially when you wish to look at, say, for example, the Welsh law, which I think has been criminally overlooked by both British and. North American writers and channels and things like that, Emily, where it's, it's only sort of over the last 10 years that I think the Welsh Fae have kind of come forward together. There's a couple together. of wonderful Llewellyn authors uh, doing Welsh stuff, and it's Christopher Hughes, of course. Mm. And, um, oh, what's her name? Starling, who's just brought out Welsh witchcraft. I've not read, but it looks marvellous. Yeah, I've saw so that. There are a couple of really good books that people should check out from, from Llewellyn. For sure. I mean, I grew up not far from from Wales, and so the Welsh landscape was yeah. very formative for me. And I a lot of work with um, Merlin mm. Energies on the Welsh landscape too. Yeah, the Mabinogion and everybody should yes should read as a, a real source, like a primary source of mm. those the myths of that landscape. But yeah, it's it's very difficult when you're writing about fairy for a broad audience and yeah. a broad subject because damn that has become a huge umbrella that is a, that is a large yes a large umbrella term and so you're trying to like right and to define what fairy is yes and you're like well i can't i can't do that because this has now become such a huge umbrella term that we're covering everything from nature spirits which are not necessarily the same thing but they've sort of become lumped in with yeah with fairy beings so everything from tiny pinpoints of light that you might see flitting around trees at night to huge spirits of a mountain to the she to fairy beings that are a race in their own right the multi- multiple races within yes within the fairy race that are very very different mm-hmm. uh, from different landscapes and from different cultures and different origins then there's oh but then there is overlap between some of them and some of the stories kind of have their own versions and you're just like it's immensely complicated yes so that's why i think the best the best kind of recourse is to try and give people starting points in all of this broad area and explain that it is a broad area and that there are differences and where the similarities might be and to give you the, the resources to kind of start off and work it out for yourself. Yes. Um, but to to open the senses in a way that can help you to not only connect to the other worlds, but also to sense what is real and what's illusory. Because not only do you have to deal with the potential uh, minefield of misinformation that's out there, but also when you want something, when you want that connection desperately, you can, uh, the human mind can create false experiences. Mm. So you have to learn what's, what's, how to discern what is a real experience or valid experience and what is, what has been created by your mind, mm. training the imagination to become an extra sense, a way of perceiving what is intangible to our physical senses 
Um, and and then also being able to discern what is actually just a creation of our imagination. Yes. If that isn't awfully off putting to everybody. Um, <laughs> I hope it isn't. There really are ways that you can that you can train yourself and expand expand your connection and awareness to 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 learn this discernment. I assure you it's not <laughs> as difficult as the rest. Well, I was going to say, do you think that was important? Because that was a really interesting aspect of Seeking Fairy is the fact that you've put these exercises in to help people find a level of connection in whichever way they wish to do so. As you say, from from beginner to, to sort of full on wanting to to journey into a, a real spiritual connection with the fairy, Emily. So for you, was that an important aspect, once again, to allow people of a variety of knowledge levels or interest to kind of pick segments of the book or certain subjects and chapters that, as you say, it's such a broad umbrella and it's such a, a massive expanse of knowledge and connection that for some people it can be quite overpowering when you kind of dip your toe into it and you're, you're coming from a base of thinking that fairies are all helpful friendly little flicky things that fly about and help people out. Whereas as soon as you dive into the Scottish and Irish myths, you realise that you, oh, sure. if you if you have the misfortune of crossing paths with one, you're probably going to uh, regret the they, day that that happened. They're going to eat you. <laughs> I mean, I mean, human snacks. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's another important level of discernment as well. It's like, A, discerning whether an experience is real or not, and then B, discerning whether, the, whether it's a friend or... Or whether you should be fleeing <laughs> carefully backwards, keeping your eyes on it at all times. And I hope that the ex the, the exercises are for me the most as as important as any information I might provide, because they're going to strengthen your ability to not only sense whatever might be around, um, but also your knowledge of, of etiquette and so on, how to deal with these uh, situations that you might come across. Mm. Very important to be prepared. Um, and in, informed in case, you know, when, because you have, because this, because it is real, you can't just punce about saying that you think it's real, but then acting as if everything is a fantasy and revolves around you because it doesn't. Yes. Humanity is not necessarily the most important player in the situation, you know? Mm. Yeah, very much so. I think it is one of those interesting aspects. Obviously, one of your, your fellow authors has w written a wonderful book on the history of witchcraft in cinema and entertainment in the US, oh. um, which has which has caused me no end of delight because I've uncovered all kinds of things. Because The Wizard of Oz is one of my favourite films of all time, uh, primarily for Margaret Hamilton's incredible performance. Yeah. And, and also the, the absolutely awful things that were going on through the production of that film, which are absolutely terrifying. Really? To, to anybody, especially someone such as yourself, only to kind of look back and hear the stories that went on. Um, I mean, like Margaret Hamilton being set on fire. Um, so if you watch The Wizard of Oz carefully, you will notice the point from when she catches fire. After that, she wears black gloves through the rest of the film. Oh, my God. Because she got third degree burns. <sighs> and so uh, she was off work for six weeks. <laughs> Um, but, oh no, Jesus Christ. Yeah, but the worst thing about that was that obviously she wore green paint makeup. Yeah. Um, and when she was set on fire, um, all her arms were burnt, but the paint was still on. So oh. they, had to, they had to scrub her arms and hands with uh, alcohol, I think, to get the paint out so she didn't get infected. And she was off work for six weeks with it. Oh, and then just said, yeah, I'll come back to work, but I'm not doing anything else with fire. Which is fair. Yes, you know, and a stunned woman got blown up. Uh, got permanent scarring on her legs, riding the broomstick and things. So it's, uh, <laughs> you know, and that's, and that's before we even get to what happened to Judy Garland. But, um, so it's, it's very interesting for me when you look at these kind of aspects that mm -hmm. how the, the perception of, of the Fae probably going hand in hand with the, the knowledge and the understanding of, of witchcraft and Wicca as, as we've developed and become more open minded and, and begun to sort of allow you know, because Wicca has always been around, it's just kind of been ostracized or, or, or demonized for a large part of the 20th century. It's only sort of the recent years, but it was very interesting to see that even someone who has this universal acclaim of being a really lovely person, Mr. Rogers, um, was, was castized and caused a sort of coming together of American 
witches because he basically did a segment with Margaret Hamilton on his show saying that witches weren't real. And that kind of empowered uh, a group of American witches to come together as, as a kind of positive change in regards to the perception of how witchcraft was viewed by the, the general media because they were saying, well, you know, we're not evil, we are real, we exist, but we aren't what you think we are. We are spiritual connected people who just follow a different path. Mm. So for you, because you are obviously someone who also follows Wicca practices as well, mm. do you think that's also important when you look at the comparisons between how Wicca and the the knowledge of, of the Fae has increased Primarily, probably at, at the most part over the last 20 years then, Emily. Oh, interesting. I, I wonder whether it hasn't gone a little bit too far at the moment, actually, um, into witchcraft and Wicca becoming very fashionable and trendy. And then it becomes quite a superficial thing and it becomes people call themselves witches. It's like a fashion statement. Yes. So it's almost gone a little bit too far and whether um, fairy law has almost paid a price for that as well in that as as part of this witchcraft and spirituality becoming very TikTok yes. trendy and, and all of this other stuff, people sort of see the surface yes. and the aesthetic of fairy and haven't ne don't necessarily delve into the truth of it. So I think it's important um, that people go back to the roots of it. Yes. So I think it's wonderful that these things are becoming more uh, accepted and, and popular um, and accessible for people, of course. And TikTok, like any social media, has got um, two sides to it. Like we've been saying, wonderful that people can connect and find ideas. And then there's a lot of misinformation there too. Um, so, 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 yeah, I, I think there's a balance to be found because um, there is a positive side to to all of this. Um, and I think both both Wicca and Witchcraft and the Fairy Path, which are kind of have their connections as well, mm. have in recent years also uh, got a particular connection to the environmental concerns. Yes. So there's a growing awareness on, on that front. Um, and so that's great. So, so I'm, yeah, so I'm very glad that it's no longer illegal, for example. Yes. <laughs> and I just hope that the many people who are pursuing these things because, but for whatever reason, whether they, whether it's because they are sort of drawn to the aesthetic initially, whether they feel a calling from within them, mm -hmm. that they can find good information to nurture themselves so that they're not just eating the they're just not they're not just consuming the spiritual equivalent of junk food. Yes. But that they can find some something more deeply nurturing on a soul level and that will enable them to continue to source that from from the world and from their own connections themselves. Yes. Absolutely. And I would suspect that if anybody wants a, a an excellent starting point, I would recommend either of your books in regards to the fairy. Well, thank you very much. So before I let you go, after your wonderful conversation, and thank you very much for, for your time today. Well, thank you. Emily, it's been a real pleasure to, to speak with you on a variety of topics. Obviously, you've, you've continued to push boundaries in your, your acting career and, and, and all aspects of that, and, and long may it continue. So for you, is it a concept of, of utilising both of the, you know, these passions that you have in regards to your love of of demystifying the fae as well as sort of bridging the gap and and as we were saying about Shakespeare using it in in a in a more modern challenging way are these the kind of aspects that you're wanting to go forwards because obviously the last two years for someone such as yourself must have been deeply challenging as a as a as a wonderful performer as you are thank you it was a challenging time for everybody in the industry and I touch touch wood. I'm very grateful that I I didn't have too bad a time of it. I kept very busy, um, and I sort of embraced acceptance of the things I couldn't change. I think that if it wasn't for lockdown, I wouldn't have finished these books, for instance. So for me, going forward, pushing boundaries and so on. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I think the thing that's most difficult for me in terms of my theatre work and COVID is that the boundaries that I was pushing were in terms of audience connection. Yes. So they they these. Intimate shows involved direct physical 
and emotional contact with an audience, mm. which I'm still not sure that that's still not okay now. Um, and we were pushing that further and further to involve the audience more and more. So with Richard the Third, um, the audience were given roles, but they weren't necessarily expected to 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 do much. I guided them through it. They didn't get scripts or anything like that. They could add a little bit with me if they wanted to, mm. but I would greet them as if they were that character, and I would shake their hands and so on. Then the show after that Hamlet and experience, they got like two scripts. They had things to say. The person playing Horatio, I would hug them and all of this stuff. It's very intimate. People were dying on each other. Yes, and all kinds of stuff, and that's just obviously not possible now. So I can't really explore further in that direction. Mm. But I think that's what hap- that what has happened or what is happening with my work, because obviously, as we've spoken, you may gather slight over the years, it's kind of gone theatre magic, theatre magic. And there's always been a kind of an interweaving between the two, but it's not necessarily been that obvious, but like they've always coexisted, but it's been the emphasis has been more on this one and then more on this and then more on this. And now they're so interwoven. Mm. That I think that my emphasis going forward is going to be a very conscious weaving of that. Um, for example, some of the exercises in Seeking Fairy, which can be applied to many, just to broadly in, in a magical way, in magical development, involves movement and voice, mm. the development of connection with your body and your voice as a vehicle for the soul as part of your connection with the world and with the other world. These things are very important to me. That totally comes from discovering this through my theatre work and and magic. Yes. And so over these last few weeks, actually, um, it's the last it's the last session tomorrow. I've been um, with my dear friend Sarita de Este, I've been teaching a nine week course on the goddess Hecate, mm-hmm. Hecate um, a, a devotional course. And Sarita's area has been the history and the, the knowledge and the information. Mine has been the creative self inside of it and finding your own path. And, and again, developing the movement and the voice and the voice as the way that carries the, the soul energy and so on. So, yeah, it's, I'm at one of those points. I think I'm at a bit of a crossroads. Like, it's weird because I've got stuff going on, but I almost feel like... I'm at that what's next moment. And I think what's next is a very conscious interweaving of these two presenting mm. the magic of theatre or a new theatre movement that involves magic or a new magical movement that involves more theatre or something, maybe more ritual theatre. But yeah, all of these aspects, now it's time for them to come together, I think, in a really powerful way for me. I'm not entirely 100% sure what form that is yet, yep. but I'm looking forward to finding out. Yeah, and so am I. Going on your previous <laughs> body of work, Emily, I look forward to whatever you decide to uh, present to us. I'm sure it'll be uh, thoroughly challenging, and hopefully you get a chance to, to uh, tour and visit the your old stomping ground of Yorkshire at some point in the future. Oh, yeah, I hope so. I will look into that, yeah. Yeah, well, if you do, let me know. And- Pint on me. <laughs> Thanks. I look forward to that. So, um, where can everybody keep up to date with your work, Emily, and get a hold of a copy of your fabulous body of work? Oh, thank you. So, um, I need to update my website. I may well do that tonight. Um, it's uh, emilycarding.com, www.emilycarding.com, and I try to put all my latest news on there. I am on Twitter at Emily Carding. I'm on Facebook. I'm very easy to find. Just I don't have any fancy woo-woo names. I'm just Emily Carding everywhere. <laughs> Seeking Fairy and Fairy Craft are available, and so potent art, the magic of Shakespeare are available um, from Llewellyn or any good books bookstore. Um, Seeking Fairy, I think, is out in the UK at the end of this month. It's already out in the US. Um, I think you can get it from Blackwells, though, in the UK. And my tarots are all available on online wherever um, you you like to shop um, um <laughs> but you can also order them from from your bookstores too but those are published by a uh, shiver books or red feather which is their tarot imprint and um many other anthologies as well through avalonia books and then they have some other things coming out soon i have the second edition of the transparent oracle which is coming out this summer yes and if anybody is in devon and they want to catch quintessence i'm doing a very short run um, as part of Barn- of Bar- Barnstaple Fringe Festival. It's a very small and friendly festival in Barnstaple in uh, June. Um, if anybody's in, in my neck of the woods in Hastings, I'm playing Cleopatra in Antony and Cleopatra this 
June before then as well. Mm-hmm. So come, come say hi. But yeah, if you go to my website, I will update it and everything will be on there, I promise. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you. You're a, a, a deeply interesting and a fun person to speak with. Thank you for your time today. Thank you so much. You take care.